First things first. I am verified on Twitter. <laughs> Whoa, boy. Those of you who follow me on Twitter might know that for the last 11 years I've been fighting with Twitter organizers to convince them that I should get the tag because I've, had been, I've been fighting with various copycats on Twitter over and over again. Finally, yesterday, I got it, so that's all I needed. Now, many of you remember me as someone who used to work for a company called Data Fellows, or maybe more likely as someone who used to work for a company called F-Secure. But now I am working for a company called WitSecure. F-Secure split into two companies first day of July. The consumer side is called F-Secure. The business-to-business -business side is called WitSecure. Those are separate companies. We are still headquartered in Helsinki, Finland. We are still in the same building. But those buildings, that building is now split into different floors. People who work for WitSecure can't get in to F-Secure floors and the other way around, which is weird, but that's the way it is. However, there are exceptions. I actually work for both companies. I spend 90% of my time on WitSecure, but then WitSecure sells 10% of my time to F-Secure, so I can actually enter both floors or both areas of the company, which is, which is nice. So one of the largest data security companies in the Nordics split into two companies. F-Secure is 400 people, WitSecure is 1,300 people, consumer side and business side. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm not here to think about that. I'm here to think about the unthinkable. So how do we start this? Well, when the door opened and the captain walked in carrying his RK-62 rifle, I realized that we have been caught. As you know, in Finland we have a military draft system. All the males get to go to army, they do a year of training, then after that they go back regularly for refreshers. And the thing which is important about our military draft system is that we try to put experts in the position in their reserve unit which would match with their civilian skills. Which means, whenever I go back to the army, well, first of all, they don't make me cut my hair anymore. You only have to do it the first time around. <laughs> Second of all, they don't give me a rifle anymore. They give me a keyboard, because I'm much more, how should I say it, effective with a keyboard than with a rifle. That's the logic. If someone is an expert in telecommunications, that's what they do in the reserves. If someone is good with cyber stuff, that's what they do in the reserve. If someone is a civilian doctor, that's what they do in the reserves. So one of the refreshers I did years ago involved a rehearsal where we were going around Finland, changing locations every day or every other day with a small group of geeks, and we had a mission of launching attacks against the military network. And there was another team which spent that week trying to find us, so trying to physically find us. They were going behind us, trying to use different forensics to figure out what we were doing and where we were. Very hands-on, very interesting, very exciting. Also the kind of thing you don't get to do in normal civilian environments. And yes, on day six of the refresher, we were caught. When the door opened and the captain walked in, we knew that, okay, we survived for six days, but we didn't survive forever. So Finland has had a very big neighbor for a very long time. Very big and very unpredictable neighbor. Both my grandfathers fought the Russians in the Second World War. 
And we've been thinking about how to prepare ourselves for the unthinkable as long as we've been independent. And today that of course involves how do you prepare yourself and your society with technology. Technology is changing the world right now, during our time, faster than ever before. I think this is pretty obvious. I think it's pretty obvious that there's a massive revolution going around us. But it's surprisingly hard to see the size of the revolution you're living in when you're living inside of it. And th this is what's happening to us. We have an idea that technology and connectivity are changing the world. But it's kind of hard to see just how big this change is. And I've been thinking about this a lot over the last two and a half years, because I spent the pandemic time writing a book. This one right here came out in English last month. And in the book, I try to illustrate how the world changed and how it changed for the better and for the worse, thanks to this connectivity revolution. The internet is the best thing which has happened during our time and the worst thing which has happened during our time. It's bringing us all these great benefits at the very same time. It's exposing us to completely new kinds of risks, completely new kinds of crime. Crime used to be local. Today, crime is global. One factoid I have in the book is that in 1994, in Finland, there were 140 bank robberies. 140 bank robberies in which robbers went to a bank with guns to steal cash. Think about that. 140 times a year. The last time we had a bank robbery in Finland was 11 years ago. Of course, they don't happen anymore. Neither, you don't have bank robberies either because banks don't really exist. They're only online. The few banks we have in the real world don't have much cash. Bank robbers have went online, just like all the other criminals. And the real world bank robbers were living close to the bank they were robbing. They were from the same city, from the same town. They were from within the 100 kilometer radius from the bank. This was local crime. Today, when our online banking systems or credit card systems are getting hit by online bank robbers, they are not from the same city or town or country at all. They can be from anywhere on the planet because that's one thing the internet did. It took away geography. Internet deleted geography. It deleted distance. And in many ways, it also deleted borders. And this is not the first time a massive technology revolution changes the world. Of course, we've seen this before. And the best comparison in many ways is the revolution we saw pretty much exactly 150 years ago. The revolution of the electric grid. City of Stockholm got its first electricity grid in 1870. In 1870, you started replacing the gas lights around the streets with electric lights. Almost exactly 150 years ago. Most cities in Europe started installing electric grids around that time. And during these years, during these decades, electricity has become completely mandatory for our societies. Today, no society survives without electricity. Today, when we, when we see electricity cuts or blackouts, they're very short, thankfully. Because if we would have extended blackouts, days, weeks, months, years, our societies couldn't function. We can't move around. We can't communicate. Our factories won't run. We can't feed our people. As simple as that. And we are not there yet with connectivity. 
if internet goes down and stays down, it's not going to stop our society. Yes, it would be painful. Yes, it would be very expensive. But we would survive. SAS would still be flying their planes from Arlanda. The trams would still be going to Central Station. They couldn't be selling tickets online because there would be no internet, but they could function. Factories would continue making food without connectivity. They couldn't do it without electricity, but they can still do it without connectivity for now. For a few more years. But it's coming. In 10 years, in 20 years, connectivity will be as mandatory for our society as electricity. Connectivity will be as mandatory as electricity. Eventually, an internet cut is going to shut down our, our society. People will start dying without connectivity. In fact, I could also forecast that eventually we'll see a time when an internet cut will cut power. Right now, it works the other way around. If we lose electricity, obviously, routers won't run without electricity, so we lose internet as well. What I'm saying is eventually, an internet cut will cut electricity. Am I crazy? No, I'm serious. I think this will happen, because everything will become interconnected. Yes, it's going to take a while, but this is the future that we're headed towards. Technology revolution is changing everything. Internet is the best thing and the worst thing that's happening during our time. And quite often it's the exact same things which are the best and the worst things. Let me give you an example. When internet came around, it changed all of our lives, but it was especially a big change for minorities. And here we can think about all possible kinds of minorities. Definitely sexual minorities, but even, even someone who just happened to have a rare hobby would be a minority. Before the internet, if you were different, you were alone. If you were different, you were alone. You knew no one else like you in your city or town or wherever you were. Then the internet comes around and suddenly you'll find that there's tons of people just like you, who think like you, who are like you. They're just far away, but now you can reach them. And this is great. But then when we look at destructive ideologies or destructive minorities, like extremists or school shooters, or let's say people who dream about suicide, they will also find exactly the same kind of support from exactly the same place, from the forums on the internet. It is the best thing and the worst thing. We get both. And we can't just choose the good parts. We get both. And technology isn't neutral. We quite often get these claims that, you know, technology is just a tool. It can be used for good or bad. Well, yeah, true. But clearly there are technologies which are being used much more for bad than good. And I don't think technologies by themselves are as innocent as we often like to portray them. But the problem is when we innovate something, we cannot uninnovate it. When something has been invented, it's with us forever. No matter how much some politicians hate strong security, aka strong encryption, they can't make it go away. Because we have invented it. It exists. So the only way it can be restricted is by making it illegal, which is exactly the wrong thing to do. Because if you want to control people who break the laws, you cannot make things illegal and make them stop break the law. They already are breaking the laws. I don't think many of us were, were expecting what happened on the 24th of February this year. I certainly wasn't. 
I was reading the same articles coming from stories based on uh, information published by U.S. intelligence and U.K. intelligence in which they over and over again said that they have intelligence which would indicate that Russia would be invading Ukraine. I just didn't believe it. A friend of mine, Dmitry Alperovich, I've known him for years, and he was repeating the same thing. You know, Russia is preparing to invade. I didn't believe him. Why? Because it made no sense. Clearly, Russia wasn't ready to invade Ukraine. Clearly, they can't invade Ukraine. They're not ready to do it. Yet, they invaded anyway. And yet, they weren't ready. So it didn't make any sense. It was hard to see that this would happen because it made no sense. But they did it anyway. So now, today, we're faced with the fact that there's a war in Europe. And this is not a faraway war. This is a war which is happening dead center in Europe, and it's happening actually surprisingly close to where we are right now. There are towns in Sweden which are further away from us right now than Chernobyl, Ukraine. Chernobyl isn't that far away. There's northern towns in Lapland, in Sweden, which are further away than Ukraine. Ukraine has had a long and complicated history with a very big neighbor as well, just like we have. They have an even longer border. We, Finland and Sweden, we have 1,340 kilometers of border with the Russians. I'd like to think of it as a joint border that Finland and Sweden has together. Maybe we are sort of like a buffer between you and Russia. Something like that. And if one of the reasons why Russia invaded Ukraine was to try to keep NATO away from their borders, now, as we're joining both NATO, Russia will more than double their NATO border. And make no mistake, we will join. The main reason why our politicians, our Prime Minister, Sanna Marin and our president, Sauli Niinistö, were so decisive on joining NATO. It wasn't really that we needed the support of a military union or we needed some kind of assistance. No, it really started from talks late last year where President Putin very straightforwardly said that, you know, Finland can't join. Finland is not free to make such a decision, as if it wouldn't be our own choice to make. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Putin. It is our own choice to make, and we do make our own choices. So it, it will happen. So what's the importance of cyber in all of this? When you look at the things that governments do with offensive cyber tools, clearly the biggest thing they've been doing for years is not about waging war, it's about espionage. Using offensive cyber tools to spy, or using offensive cyber tools to collect information for espionage purposes, or for information gathering or intelligence gathering purposes. That's the number one thing that governments both in the East and in the West have been doing. Sure, we also have examples where governments use offensive cyber tools, some of you might call them cyber weapons, to do sabotage. Stuxnet would be a great example of that. And then there's one more border to cross, and that's full-blown cyber war, which happens when two countries which are at war are launching attacks against each other using offensive cyber tools. 
clearly then that is cyber war. But I don't believe we will ever see a situation where two countries would be waging only cyber war on each other. It's one of the theaters or one of the domains for war. Just like in Ukraine, they are fighting on land, on sea, in air, in space, and in cyberspace. In all of them, at the same time. It's just a domain for waging war. But these tools, cyber tools for war or cyber weapons, are different from all other weapons. The power of most weapons is not in using them, but in showing them. It's enough to have the weapons and to make sure that your enemy knows that you have the weapons. This is the reason why countries do military parades. This is the reason why you can go to Wikipedia and check any country's air force or navy and you'll get a listing of how many fighter jets they have. How many navy ships do they have? How many aircraft carriers? How many tanks? This is all public information. So we have great visibility into traditional weapons because the biggest power of traditional weapons is in deterrence. If everybody knows you have the weapons, then you don't need to use the weapons, because they know you have the weapons. The prime example of this is nuclear. Nuclear weapons. This is the prime example, because nuclear weapons have been used in mankind's history in war two times. In 1945. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's it. There are tens of thousands of nuclear warheads on this planet right now in the 11 countries which have nuclear weapons today. And the power of those nuclear weapons obviously is not in using them, it's in having them. And everybody knows who has nuclear weapons. It's the countries which do nuclear weapons testing. That's why one of the reasons why testing has been done, to show that you have the capability. And by the way, here's a party trick question to you. The question is, when was the last year that Russia did a nuclear weapons test? And then your friends will guess various years and they will all be wrong. Because the answer is never. Russia hasn't tested nuclear weapons at all. The last time they tested nuclear weapons was in 1991, when it was the Soviet Union. So for more than 30 years, Russia hasn't detonated a single nuclear weapon, not even underground. Which really makes you wonder if their nuclear weapons would even work anymore after 31 years of corruption and whatever is going on inside Russia. So if cyber weapons <clears throat> have no deterrence power, is there a way to get deterrence power for them somehow? Maybe in the next military parade we could have a truck filled with geeks and nerds with keyboards and... Probably not. How could we do it for real? Well, I guess you could have a... Uh, some kind of a war game where you would invite outsiders and representatives from other countries and then you would show how you're launching cyber attacks against test targets to, for example, disable, I don't know, air control systems or radar systems similar to countries that you are worried about. That would show that you have the capability, but then again, nobody would really believe what you're doing unless you would show for real what you're doing. Not just showing screens going blank, but actually showing that, yeah, there's this vulnerability in this system and here's how we connect and here's how we exploit it. And you can't do that. You can't do that because cyber weapons are the only weapons in the world which you cannot show to your enemies because they will get a copy of your weapons of your tools just by seeing them. If you show your tanks to your enemy, they don't get a copy of the tanks. But if you show your exploit, they do. 
And this is not just theoretical. We have examples of nation states launching attacks against each other using exploits which are then repurposed by the victim countries to attack back. This has already happened. It's sort of like if you have two tribes fighting in the jungle and one of the tribe doesn't have swords, the only thing they have to do is to wait for the other tribe to throw swords at them and then, then they do have swords. And this doesn't apply to any other weapon. And this is made worse by the fact that cyber tools, offensive cyber tools, have a limited shelf life. They have a best before date. They expire. They rust. They rust just like real world weapons do. Imagine an effective attack today targeting, I don't know, latest Linux kernel, zero day Linux kernel right now, or in Windows or iPhone or some military system. How long will it work? How long will it be effective? A year? Sure. Two? Probably. Five? In most cases. Ten? I don't think so. Fifteen? No. Bugs are found and fixed. Vulnerabilities are detected and corrected. Systems change. They are rewritten from scratch and the things you're targeting will go away. So think about this. You have these offensive tools developed by governments which are expensive to develop. They get no deterrence value out of them. No one knows they have them and they will die soon. So the whole investment is thrown into garbage. No one even knows you had them. You had no deterrence value, you had no practical value. Cyber weapons are great and awful. As weapons, they're great. They're effective, they're affordable, they're deniable. That's an excellent combination. But at the same time, they provide no deterrence and they have a much more limited shelf life than tanks or Navy ships or fighter jets. So during the Ukraine conflict, how much have we actually seen? What kind of things have we actually seen? I guess the best example of offensive cyber capability happened in the very beginning of the war. Many of you might remember that on the first days of the war, the news stories were filled with shootage or, or films about Ukrainian women and children queuing on the border of Poland, trying to cross the border. And they couldn't get through. They were like massive queues. Reporters were mystified. Why can't the people leave the country? Well, the, the explanation is that Russians had been using their cyber attacks to wipe the computers on the, the Ukrainian border control systems. The borders were open, but everything was done with pen and paper. That's why they had the queues. And this is very practical. This is very real world. This is what cyber war looks like in 2022. But it's been fairly quiet for the last couple of months. Before the invasion, we saw plenty of activity. During the invasion, we saw plenty of the activity. And during the first weeks, maybe the first two months, plenty of activity. But it's been getting more quiet. And I'm surprised. Because Russians do have capabilities. But we are not seeing them use them right now in the middle of this open public conflict. When, there are actually, when there's actually a war going on. And the best explanation I have is that the traditional generals in Russian military who run the war effort right now believe that the role of cyber is in softening the battlefield before the attack. But then when the real war starts, cyber takes the back seat. When missiles start flying and bombs start dropping and tanks roll over the borders, then cyber takes a back seat. Maybe a little bit old school thinking, but that's the explanation I have. Now, this is not for the lack of um, 
I mean, there has been some attempts during these months. Most importantly, the Industroyer 2 attack, which we saw in the end of April. Industroyer 1 was the attack in 2017 and 18, where Russian military operations cut power at Prikarpato Oblenergo and in two other Oblenergos inside Ukraine. They tried doing it again a couple of months ago, and they failed. And this is an example on how Ukraine has been successful in defending themselves. In fact, Ukraine is the best, best country in Europe to defend their networks against nation-state level attacks from Russia. They're number one. They're better than we are, or you are, or Germany, or France, or UK. They're the best. Why? Because they've been doing it for eight years. They've been doing it for eight years, day in, day out. There's the old law that you become a world-class expert after doing 10,000 hours of something. The Ukrainian cyber defenders have done their 10,000 hours. They are world-class experts. And there's been plenty of things to learn from. Many of you remember this photo from 2018. It's the NotPetya attack. You see NotPetya screens in this supermarket cashier systems. And I went back to my notes to 2018, because I wanted to find out where this photo was taken. Well, it was taken in a supermarket chain called Rost. And this photo is from Rost Kharkiv in Harkova, in southern Ukraine. So I googled Rost Kharkiv. It was bombed three months ago by the Russians. So the very same supermarket was hit first by a cyber attack, then by a real-world attack. This is what cyber war looks like. What about then the attackers who are not part of the government? There's been plenty of talks about civilians, including organized crime gangs who support their countries, and about activists and hacktivists, both from the West as well as from Russia. What's their role? Well, many of the most visible patriotic hacker groups from Russia disappeared, or sorry, appeared out of nowhere in the beginning of the war. Killnet, Hacknet, and No Name 57 are all examples of groups like these. They are not part of the government. They're not trying to make money, but they are trying to target targets they believe would help Russia in this war. They communicate over Telegram or in Tor Hidden Service chats, and they synchronize attacks against targets they believe would make some difference for Russia in this war effort. And since they are not trying to make money, that makes them a different group from the organized crime groups operating from Russia. Most famously, group Conti. Now, Conti has disbanded roughly three months ago. We believe most of the Conti members now are active parts of other organized crime groups in Russia, such as Lockpit. But they famously aligned themselves with the Russian government on the very beginning of the war. This is a screenshot I took from the Tor Hidden Service website of Conti on the 25th of February, when the war started on the 24th, and they aligned themselves with the Russian government. So what does that mean in practice? Well, here's a bigger screenshot three weeks later from the same site. It's the site they use as their leak site, where they use leaks from their victim companies as a way to force them into paying ransom. One of the companies listed on the page is called Nordex. What's this? What does Nordex do? Well, Nordex is a German company, actually originally a Danish company, but then bought by a German company, which is one of the largest energy 
creation and distribution companies in Europe. And this is a recurring theme. We've also seen Russian attackers, especially Hacknet, hack into uh, and, and do data leaks from companies like DTEC. And DTEC is one of the largest energy providers inside Ukraine. Why are these gangs targeting energy distribution and energy creation in Europe? Because one of the weapons in this war is energy. One of the main ways Russia can affect us, the rest of Europe, is through Russian oil, coal and gas. And the better they can disrupt operations with European energy, energy distributors or energy creators, the better it is for them. So for these criminal gangs, it's, it's a win-win scenario. They make money, but they're also helping their motherland by choosing which victims or which kind of victims they're targeting. So the world is changing. If you go back and think about how the world changed in the Second World War. Well, the war ended between the United States and Japan with the nuclear holocaust. And it's quite easy to say that nuclear physicists People working with nuclear physics lost their innocence in 1945. Exactly in the same way, we, computer scientists, we've lost our innocence exactly in the same way as our research area has now become a tool for conflicts and a tool for wars. And there's no going back. Once again, we cannot uninvent things which have been invented. So is it all bad news? Are we only seeing doom and gloom in our area of expertise, which is computer security? Well, no. You see, I'm an optimist. And that might be surprising, because I've spent 31 years working with the worst parts of the internet, with the scum of the internet, with the criminals, the attackers, the worst aspects of this technology revolution. Yet, I am an optimist about the future. I believe that the security of our systems has never been better. I believe that the security of the computers you use day in, day out has never been better. And I know it doesn't look like it. The reason why it doesn't look like it is that only the bad news are news. Imagine you yourself or, I don't know, the IT team in your organization learning about a new vulnerability affecting your systems and then working through the night patching everything, making sure all systems are updated and fixed and updated and patched. And they finish patching the last server at 6 a.m. And then at 7 a.m. an outside attacker scans through your IP range looking for vulnerable machines and they find none. You're safe. Nothing happened. These guys, these guys, these girls, maybe you, did a heroic thing, and no one will know. Because the only thing that happened because of the work they did was nothing. And I can guarantee to you that tomorrow's newspapers here in Sweden will not have a headline which says that the second largest company in Sweden was not hacked yesterday. That's not news. When a company gets hacked, that is news. So we only see the failures. And it's easy to see only the bad sides, when the truth is our security is better than ever. And one of the biggest changes in there has been new, new operating systems. 
iOS is 15 years old. In many ways, this has exactly the same or similar platform than a games console. This is a PlayStation or an Xbox. A PlayStation or an Xbox is obviously a computer. Xbox even runs Windows. But you never hear about viruses or worms or hacks on PlayStations, do you? No, because it is a computer which is shut down, closed down. You can't program it yourself. Even though you own the box, you can't program it. Exactly the same thing applies here. And that's a very, very restrictive model, but it's also a secure model. Mikko, how can you say it's secure when we've all seen the headlines about Pegasus from NSO infecting iPhones belonging to ministers and parliament members and MEPs? Well, this, my friends, this is not a security failure. No, this is a security success story. This is a success story. Why? Because it costs 100,000 euros to hack an iPhone with Pegasus. How much does it cost to hack your Windows laptop? Like, you know, 10 kroner. Which means your phone only gets targeted if you are worth 100,000 euros for an attacker. And here, the only attackers using this tool are governmental attackers. So you don't have to worry about criminals, only governments. Most of us will never be targeted by a foreign government if the price for targeting our phone is 100,000 euros. They might target our computers, but they won't target our phones. This is a success story. So I've been a computer security guy all my life. Practically all my life, ever since I was 21 years old. I was 21 when I reverse engineered my first malware. I still have it with me because I always carry it here. <laughs> I even have my tailor make my suits exactly the right size so I can fit a five and quarter inch floppy disk into my pockets. <laughs> True story. So I've thought for decades that my job is to secure computers. I'm a computer security guy. I secure computers. But slowly, I've started to realize that today, everything runs on computers. As I explained in the beginning, connectivity is becoming the new electricity. Our societies run on computers, which means my job, your job, our job, is no longer to secure computers, it is to secure the society. That's our job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Miko. Um, you get to keep the floppy. Is, what is it? Is Thank it form? You. Yeah, it's form. <laughs> it is form. Uh, it doesn't fit. Hmm. I, have to, I have to talk to my tailor. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll send my tailor's contact information. <laughs> what do you, um, what's your defi definition of cyber war? Hmm. You said it's not cyber war. Sometimes it's uh, sabotage. Mm -hmm. If one country is attacking with all its might on another country and there's no kinetic war, is that a cyber war or is it just acts of sabotage? Well, Maybe the discussion on the exact words is a bit academic, but I actually do believe that words matter. And I strongly do believe that if something isn't war, we shouldn't be calling it a war. And right now, we see a massive um, devaluation of the word war, because it's not just cases like cyber sabotage, which gets labeled as war, even things like Phishing attacks launched by a government against another government to steal information is called cyber war, when it clearly isn't cyber war, it's intelligence gathering or spying. Spying isn't war, 
Espionage isn't war. Spying is spying, espionage is espionage. And if two countries are not at war, I don't see how they could be doing cyber war against each other. And that means, in my book, Stuxnet wasn't cyber war. It was cyber sabotage. However, if USA and Israel would have been at war with Iran, then exactly the same attack would have been cyber war, because then there would have been a war. So it has to be kinetic to be able to be cyber as well. It has to be happening in other domains in addition to cyber. So. And it's not enough that it would be a cold war for it to also be a cyber war. There has to be something real in my book. It's interesting to think what will be the next domain. I mentioned we have like land war, air war, sea war, space war, cyberspace war. It's not going to end here. We have five domains today. It's, going to, it's kind of interesting to speculate what the sixth domain will be. Right now, we have no idea. The only thing we know is that whatever the sixth domain will be, it's going to sound like science fiction today. Just like cyber war sounded like science fiction 30 years ago. So it could be, I don't know, nano warfare, where enemies distributing airborne aerosol-sized tiny robots which <laughs> enter your bloodstream and change your thoughts. And if that sounds like science fiction, exactly. That's what cyber war sounded like 30 years ago. Fair enough. Do we have questions from Slido? Uh, we do have questions from the audience. One you already just answered, which is, like, oh, awesome. which is going to be the next big domain. Um, so we're going to skip that. Um, but one uh, question, you were mentioning, like, yeah, cyber weapons doesn't have deterrence, uh, but do you think the NATO exercises, like the locked shield exercises, are they a, a way of trying to build a deterrence through cyber warfare? Um, yeah. Maybe in one way they could be. I don't think locked shields and similar uh, rehearsals and competitions have been built for that purpose. But of course, they do showcase capabilities. But the vast majority of our capabilities remain hidden. I call this the fog of the cyber war. It's quite clear to see which are the best countries in offensive capability. I don't think anybody really argues against USA being number one. They've spent more money longer than any, anyone else building offensive capabilities, and it's clear that Israel is pretty good, Russia has lots of capability, China has lots of capabilities, but then when you go beyond that to smaller countries, what's the offensive cyber capability of Vietnam or South Korea? Beats me, and you can't Google for it either. So it's, um, it's kind of hard to really, really see where the real things are happening. Now, the, the deterrence value is one thing about uh, rehearsals like Lock Shields, which is a NATO uh, rehearsal. There's another thing which is also being built in these rehearsals and in uh, NATO research centers like, like the CCD COE, the Center of Excellence in Tallinn, which is the rules of war or laws of war for cyber war, which we will be needing. Today we have rules of war for real world war, like you're not supposed to bomb hospitals. You're not supposed to use chemical weapons, like these kind of rules. And I do believe that eventually we will have rules of war for cyber war. Things like when you distribute offensive cyber, war, cyber tools, malware, backdoors, they must not continue working and spreading forever. There must be a kill date. Sort of similar like you would wish to have a kill date in landmines. So when the war is over, they would no longer be killing civilians, clearly you can easily program things like these into these offensive tools, and I think they will become the norm. I also believe that we will eventually see some kind of identification requirement, that when you deploy tools, offensive cyber tools, as a government, you must sign them somehow. Maybe not so that during the conflict you would show who's behind them, but then after the conflict you could prove that this was ours. This was ours, that was yours, this was ours, things like that, which you could easily do with encrypted blobs inside the binaries. I think th things like these will become uh, part of the future of conflicts. You mean like a, a private public key scheme? I was like, oh, that's signed by the US. Yep, something like that. Just like in the real world where you're supposed to have the flag in, in your uniform to show who you are fighting for. Something like that. But deniability is one of the main features of it. That's why it's unlikely to be de deployed 
so that you could tell during the conflict who's doing what. But then after the conflict, you could prove that this was ours, or maybe someone else could prove that this was yours five years after the fact. So we could now know for real that Stuxnet was USA and Israel if they would have implemented something like that. But since they haven't, we all know it's USA and Israel, but we can't prove it. Um, okay, uh, I think, do we have any more questions from uh, the audience? There's a question right over here. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you for a really good speech. Um, I wanted to hang on to the deterrent part. Uh, why can't a nation state sponsored attack be part of the deterrent? Because that's the sort of way to show their muscles or the muscles or the intelligence that, that they carry in that country. When we look at cyber attacks, nation state cyber attacks, which have been caught the vast majority of them are from Russia and China. That's one of the reasons why Russia and China are seen so big players in cyber, when they actually are quite a lot behind in technical capabilities, behind, for example, USA and Israel, in, in, based on, on my understanding. And the reason, I believe, is that Russia and China don't really care about getting caught. Western intelligence agencies, Western governments, Western militaries think it's embarrassing to get caught. They go to great lengths to make sure that whatever they're doing in this space doesn't get caught, or if it's caught, it cannot be attributed back to them. However, in the cases where they have been caught, or when there's been leaks about these capabilities from Western intelligence agencies, I think they've been quite happy to take the credit, because that has given them the deterrence that they can't get any other way. But like I said, it's unlikely that governments would be voluntarily getting deterrence by showing their weapons, because then they are giving the tools to their enemies, because these weapons can be copied and deployed unlike any other real-world weapons. Uh, but actually, the intelligence behind the ones that are using the tools you are not giving away them. And if you are going to show the intelligence, it's like doing the parades. So they are holding back to old school deterrent ways, kind of. Couldn't it be the case? Sh certainly countries can show the end results of what they have accomplished with these tools. But that's a different story. That's not really getting deterrence from the weapons. It's getting deterrence from things you can do. Mm. And that's... We cannot compare the way we build deterrence with real-world weapons to the way we build deterrence with cyber weapons. I don't think we'll see a day where countries are voluntarily showing the technical details of their cyber weapons. It would, wouldn't, it would make no sense, I think. Thank you. CTF competition would be a military parade of the cyber domain because you're not showing the result, you're not showing a zero-day exploit, but you're showing the capability of mm. creating such exploit. So what you're saying is that Finland got a bit of deterrence when a Finnish team won the Locked Shields rehearsal? Something like that. Okay. Or, uh, I'll well, think we, that we'll take it, thank you. <laughs> you're very welcome. Yeah. Hyvä. Kiitos, kiitos. Okay, any more questions? Do you have any more questions? Um, I was thinking something, but you, you caught me off guard. It's like, who solves this first? You guys or the Russians? <laughs> you think that is? Um, the, oh yeah, I'm curious. Do, have you heard anything about how much the, you know, Finland is looking to expand its cyber capabilities now that you know, NATO is on the doorstep? Or NATO oh. is be becoming part of reality? We just got a, um, a major improvement in budgets. Um, to be put into this area. So, yeah, we are looking to improve our capabilities here, definitely. But that's just the, that's all we know for so far. But finally, we are seeing the kind of budget we should have been seeing years ago. So, That's a way of flexing the muscles as well. It is, yes. Yeah. Very true. Good. Okay, thank you very much, right. Nico. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you.